Uh, without further ado, I will jump into the topics of today. And um, we are we are reasoning on the kingship of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Ailes Selassie I, and the mystical and the messianic dimension of his kingship. So why are we talking about kingship? Obviously, the first, uh, the first answer that comes to us is that His Imperial Majesty is a king. Obviously, he is the king of kings, but we will see what other, um, what other understanding or overstanding we can get from um, his uh, being a king. Uh, we will try to address different, different uh, um, direction in this, uh, in, this, in this reasoning. And uh, we will look at a biblical interpretation of kingship we will look at the prophecies, we will look uh, on at a very important and fundamental uh, um, issue, which is that we should try to focus as Rastafari more on the kingship than on a religious worshipping of his imperial majesty. So that is not to say that we should not look at his imperial majesty as our divinity our godhead but it, it means more that we should not look at his imperial majesty just like a new jesus so we should progress from a religious and uh, we could say churchical view of his imperial majesty into a more universal view based on the kingship and the true meaning of his kingship and uh, and uh, and the effect that the kingship can have on the world at large kingship is the ultimate ultimate fullness and uh, we will try to address few questions and try to give answers to them for example why is majesty as a king one could say well you know pretty easy uh, we will see what we can add to that and why is imperial majesty returned as um, as as the returned messiah in that time and not before if he is the king why um or or, or better we should say is he the king only for ethiopians or is the king for also the nations of the world and uh, these reasonings should be should be seen in the light of overcoming also a certain approach that can be sometime fine. And uh, I call that approach the we and them mentality. So if we understand what kingship really is, we can also see that Rastafari nation is in need of collaborating with the non-Rastafari nations and the non-Rastafari nations are in need of collaborating with the Rastafari nations. Kingship is universal. Just as the mission of his imperial majesty is completely universal. So let's jump, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, the first, starting point is the definition of kingship what is kingship so if we look into the dictionary we see the the first definition is the dignity rank or office of a king in other words the state of being a king the second meaning is a monarchy the third meaning is the territory or dominion of a king in other words a kingdom so we're going to take this reasoning now in three parts, three sections. The first is the Bible. So we're going to look at kingship in the Bible, in the biblical tradition. The second part is his imperial majesty, a focus on his imperial majesty and uh, his kingship and what the kingship of his majesty really 
means. And the third part is the Rastafari liberty. So the way that we conduct our life in Rastafari liberty and how can we honor this kingship in, uh, in, in, in our daily lives. So uh, starting with why are we talking about kingship? First, first question. Well, the answer is that in the Bible, we see this topic permeating the entire scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. So the idea is that the progress of creation and mankind will start with one man called Adam and will culminate with the coming of Messiah, which will be a king, in fact. It will be the king of kings. He would be divine. He will be from the lineage of King David. And he will not rule only over Israel, but will also influence the entire world, bringing humanity, taking humanity to a new level of existence, which is often defined by the sages, and this will resonate to the Rastafari ears, defined as the stage of a new race. So the new race was, was prophesied already many, many years ago before uh, the Rastafari even claimed uh, that, that the speech of his imperial majesty in um, October 63 is exactly what we are talking about. So to find the answers to this central question, we must look obviously in the book of life. So why are we talking about kingship? How everything started? Let's look at the book of life, the Torah, the Old Testament, the five book of Moses, especially we're going to focus on this, not because the rest of the Bible is not relevant, but because we aspire to uh, look at the historical progression of kingship, concentrating on the first books of the Bible, the Old Testament. That is where we find the kings that we will be reasoning um, about this evening. So the Torah is called the Torah Hahim, the living Torah. The word Torah means instructions, means guidance, because the Torah is our guidance in life. The Bible is the book of life because it has the instructions on how to live godly on planet Earth. So the Old Testament, the Torah, the Tanakh uh, constantly makes us aware of our duties, duties in life. It give us a true definition of our purpose. And uh, not only, it also show, shows us the way to achieve these goals. So we're going to start looking there where it all began, the creation of man. Adam is the first man, and he is symbolically the first king. Why I say symbolically, meaning that, you know, he does not wear a crown, but he is there, is only, is by himself, is only him in the Garden of Eden, even before uh, Eve, and he receives dominion over all things. The Bible says, Genesis 1, 28, that Adam received this commandment to fill the earth and to conquer it and to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the every living thing that moves on earth. So the Torah begins with Genesis, and we know that. When Adam was created, the Almighty, the Creator, immediately made him aware of his powers and told him that, that he has a purpose in life. And his purpose in life will be to fill the earth and to conquer it, to have dominion and so forth. So why the first commandment is to fill the earth and to have dominion and to conquer it? Man was given the power to conquer the, wor the whole world and to have dominion over it, over the land, the sea, the air, and was commanded to do so. This was his task. How was this conquest of the world to be achieved? And what is the true purpose of this conquest of the world? Because even if we, if we, if we look at it, this is the first thing that non-biblical people will address immediately. And they will say, well, it's just arrogant that man 
should have the power to conquer the world. I mean, what is about all of this? The true meaning of the conquest of the world entrusted to man as a life task and mission is not to aggressively take advantage of the earth. But if we look deeply, the mystical, the inner meaning of these words is to elevate and perfect the world of nature, including the beasts, the animals in the service of true humanity, including all the things that occurs on earth. A humanity permeated and enlightened by the divine image and soul, which is truly a part of the Almighty. For what purpose? So that the world creation realizes that God is the creator and the world creation can manifest the presence of God. So here we see immediately what then will become the Rastafari motto, Zion on earth, heaven on earth. So let's look at something very, very fascinating. One of the main distinguishing features of man creation is that man was created as a single being, unlike the other species that were, they were created in large, large numbers, you know, the fishes of the sea, the animals, and, you know, the grass, the trees, and so forth. So man is the only one that is created by himself, alone. Why is that? Well, tradition teaches us that Adam was the prototype and example for every individual to follow. And that is why man was created single, to teach us that one person is equivalent to a world world, to the entire world. This is what we call in Rastafari, the macrocosm in the microcosm, which is a concept that we also find anyway in um, uh, orthodoxy, orthodox Christian tradition. This means that every human being, regardless of time, place, and personal status, has the highest capacity and also the duty to rise and achieve the highest degree of realization and to realize the same for creation as a whole. So Adam is the prefigur prefiguration of a king, but is not yet a king, but he already contains this mission that then we will see realized in the ultimate king, which is obviously Messiah. So which is this mission to elevate and to perfect the entire creation and the entire um, human society. So Adam is not a king, technically. I mean, he doesn't wear a crown. So looking now at the various kings in the Bible, we cannot analyze them all because we know that there are many but we will focus our reasoning on very few specific kings that are relevant to I and I subject of this evening okay so the first question when does the first king appear in the bible we need to wait 13 generations after creation that means three generations after Noah. We know that there is Noah, then there is Cush, and there is Nimrod. Nimrod is the first king. So the first king that we meet in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, is a guy by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod is king of a number of cities, including, um, including one which will become very important and uh, its name will become, you know, very diffuse and popular. This town is called Babel. Babel is the Hebrew name for Babylon. Babel um, means gates of God. Yeah. So Nimrod was the king of Babylon. We know exactly what takes place in Babel which is a major event of Old Testament. And obviously we are referring to the building of the tower, the famous tower of Babylon. So Nimrod was in charge of building the tower of Babylon. 
The next important king that we have in the Bible, and we're going to try to go quite speedily because we don't, have, we don't have all night to reason about it. The next important king that we have in the Bible, and it also begins its name with letter N, which is important, is Nabucodonosor. Nabucodonosor is the king of Babylonian, is the king of Babylon, and he is obviously famous for a number of reasons, but one of these, mainly the most important uh, reason for, wh for, for why he is famous, is that he destroys the first temple built by Solomon, destroyed by King Nabucodonosor. So there is a third king now in the history and it also he, he also begins with the letter n and we're talking about nero nero roman he destroys the second temple he was in fact the roman emperor that was in charge during the battle against um, israel of that time palestine of that time and uh, he is responsible for destroying the second temple. So Nero Caesar is referred by tradition as being, as being his address. We could say that he is addressed with a code, with a number, which is made of three numbers. And this is the th three times six. He is a prefiguration of the anti-Messiah and uh, he will come back, not he himself, but, you know, his job of being an obstacle, uh, being an enemy of Messiah will be reproduced in the fullness of time by the anti-Messiah, the final anti-Messiah that will fight the true Messiah himself and obviously is not a coincidence that Nero Roman was the, the emperor of the Roman Empire, because we know that the Antichrist, the final anti-Messiah, will be the new head of the uh, new so-called Roman Empire. So the question now is, all right, this is all very interesting, but why are we talking about bad kings? I mean, shouldn't be here talking about good kings at the end of the day we're talking about the bible so how come that we're talking about negative kings the the answer here is that there is a mystical dimension to all of this the most dangerous kings in the history of the bible in the history of israel have messianic sparks that needed to be rectified and here is the revelation the concept of kingship in the bible in our tradition starts with a negative kingship so that slowly will be rectified and it will be coming to a fulfillment with the divine and ultimate king which is the negus mesik the King Messiah. So there are sparks of divinity in the entire world. When I refer to sparks of divinity, I am referring to a very ancient and fascinating and illuminating biblical concept, which states that there is not one single corner of creation which does not carry in itself the divine presence and this divine presence is hidden in within creation and our job mankind's job and ultimately the messiah's job will be to liberate to free this inner light this inner messianic sparks that permeates the entire creation. In other words, the messianic presence is really to be found everywhere, in every aspect, 
especially, and this is the paradox, especially in the negative aspects of life. That is why kingship starts to be presented to the reader of the Bible in a negative way. Another element which proves what are we saying, Nabuchodonosor is the only king in the Bible which is called the king of kings. There is no other king in the Bible that takes on himself this title. We also know, interesting fact, when Saddam Hussein uh, became very strong in his time, he also, he also decided to do something quite interesting, which was to, um, to do a series of works you know, in his country, around his city and palace, in order to bring back to the old splendor, the Babylonian empire. And he called himself the king of kings because he wanted to be seen as the new Nabucodonosor. This is to confirm what we're saying right here. So even the title king of kings, he gets presented to I and I in a negative light, right? So this is, uh, this is just, a, 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 a preview of what will come after and there will be the time in which the, the true and the real king of kings will arrive and will rectify also this name and with this name the entire kingship so when we look at Nabucodonosor you know yes he was guilty of many things but there was something in there something in him which was very, very, very peculiar. First thing, we see that he had an advisor for himself, which was not exactly an ordinary man. Daniel was his advisor. Daniel does something quite extraordinary at that time, something that was not even allowed for the Jewish population of that time. He advises a known Jew on doing something in order to redeem his person and save his destiny in front of God. What is that? Daniel advises, we will remember that, um, Dan Nabucodonosor to give charity uh, in order to save his life, in order to save his destiny by, from, 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 from the curse. And what happens next? That uh, in that way, Nabucodonosor saves millions of Jews from starving. So there were millions of Jews at that time in Babylon, and they were living in the worst condition in which one human being could live. So Daniel knew that, and Daniel, what he does, he, 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 he advises Nebuchadnezzar to give charity to these people so that he will be granted a blessing from the Almighty, and then we know how the story goes. So we see that Nabucodonosor becomes an instrument of the Almighty. And this is also stated in the Bible. God say, Nabucodonosor is my instrument. So we, we, we see in something quite interesting here. He is also worthy of having a miracle under his own eyes, which is, of course, the miracle of the three men in the furnace, which come out completely unhurted by the fire. The point here that we are trying to make is that every king in the Bible is an instrument of the Almighty. And in every bad king, there is a spark of, we could say, messianic kingship that will be then rectified in the final king. So kingship became, became with Nimrod, which is the king of darkness. His name in Hebrew means rebellion. He is the first, uh, is the first negative rebel. Why? Because he rebels against God. So this is also very interesting because according to the mystical knowledge of the Bible, and here we're talking about Kabbalah as well, Hasidut, the, 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 bio, the biblical literature, darkness has more potential to greatness than light. Why? Because darkness must be transformed. So in kingship, we see the inner secrets of the entire Bible and the messianic project that God has 
for mankind. In one word, transformation. All bad kings are related to Messiah. They have a job. Their job is to assist the coming of Messiah. So the first people of the world is the people that built Babylon, the Babel Tower. So Babylon was the first kingdom of the world and consequently the ultimate kingdom will be rectified and governed and ruled by the ultimate Messiah. I don't know if we are seeing here the, 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 the paradox, but the, similar, the similarity as well. The messianic, the messianic history and the Bible itself is made of paradoxes. In fact, they cannot be Bible, they cannot be paradox, they cannot be, sorry, they cannot be Bible, they cannot be Messiah, they cannot be Rastafari without paradoxes. When the opposites meet exactly there on their crooks of the meeting point, that is where the messianic spark is revealed. Let's keep all these things in mind because we're gonna need them throughout the journey. Let's see now who is the most positive king in the Bible. Who is the most famous good king in the Bible? Of course, we're talking about King David. Now, we cannot speak about kingship in the Bible if we do not talk about King David. We will not address the ordinary knowledge about King David, the superficial reading that we can get from the Bible because everybody knows the story, but we will look at the mystical aspect of it. So now, one important thing. Who studies Bible? especially Bible mysticism, knows that the entire scriptures, especially the Torah, the Old Testament, is built on orders. What are the orders? Are a group of three elements. They are recurring trinities that we find in the stories of the Bible. And on these trinities, the entire script, scripture, we should say the entire st structure of the scriptures, is built. The first order is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for example. There is another order, which is Moses, Seth, and Habel. These are foundational structures on what the Bible and its meaning is built. And through these foundational structures, we can access, enter, the inner dimension of the Bible. So the inner dimension, the holiest dimension of the scriptures is revealed in this way, orders. These orders always have to do with numbers and especially number three. So the orders, this group, these trinities, they always come in number three. Just like every process has three stages. You know, it begins with the beginning, then there is the middle, then there is the end. In the same way, every, inter, every intellectual speculation is based on the principles of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So the order that is important to I and I reason this evening is the order of Adam. In Hebrew, his name is A-D-M which also stand for the three names that this order consists of. A stands for Adam, D stands for David, and M stands for Messiah. So these three figures are exactly in equal spaces within the old biblical time, Old Testament and the entire Bible. Well, Adam is at the beginning, David is in the middle, and Messiah is in the fullness of time. Adam is the first supernatural king who, like we said, received the commandment of conquering the earth and received dominion over all things. Then we have David. Who is David? He is the middle of, of the ages. He's exactly in the middle of biblical history and the divine 
plan and project that the Almighty has for mankind. He is the one that establishes the true divine kingship on earth. And then we have Messiah, which is the final, the ultimate, the definitive Adam, which has the job of completing this process of rectification and elevation of creation and mankind at large. Another important thing is that this order of these three characters, Adam, David, and uh, Messiah, have affinity with the earth, the earth, the soil, because their focus is to bring down heaven on earth, and the, they manifest and elevate creation to its own perfection, and reconnecting it to God is the ultimate mission. So this order is connected with earth. This order of these three characters, these three elements, is also connected with the first verse of the Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. So this is the order which is connected to earth. There is another order which is connected to heaven, which is the order of Moses, Hubble, and Set, which obviously we cannot address right now, but they are connected with heaven. So it's like it's like the first verse of Genesis, which we also addressed during our last minute meeting, and where we reason about God created heaven and earth and his imperial majesty in those uh, few um, initial lines of the book of Genesis. Uh, in these lines, it is presented to I and I. We could say, who will take care of earth and who will take care of heaven? So the order of Adam, David, and Messiah, they are in charge of bringing godliness on earth. The order of Moses, we say, is connected to heaven, um, but our order represents the kingship. So let's step now in the second part of the reasoning, and uh, I'm trying to make it not too long. Prophecies about his imperial majesty and his kingship. So let's look at the prophecies and what's, what the tradition says about the time and the coming of Messiah. So after the things that we have been saying so far, we should uh, have even a better understanding on, of how these prophecies, prophecies should be relevant to his imperial majesty. In other words, we can understand better maybe now the relevance of the pro of these prophecies knowing that what we have been saying so far concerning the kingship is entirely relevant to the figure of his imperial majesty one fundamental uh, passage we find in torah in the old testament in especially and specifically in the book of uh, deuteronomy when the people of Israel demands a king. So there are many, many prophecies which we could address, and um, we're not going to do that. There's only one quotation from the Bible which I want to address. You know, I selected only this one, not because the other ones are not important, but for time, we cannot look at all of them. But there is this specific verse which gets all, almost hidden in, within the whole story, but that we learn from tradition that contains a tremendous meaning. So the people of Israel demands a king. So this is the first time the idea of a king of Israel is presented to us. The exact verse in the original Bible says, place you should place upon yourself a king. Place, you should place upon yourself a king. So we know that every word in the Bible is not for granted and is not meaningless. Every word, even every um, point is important in the Bible. Even the spaces of, between the words is important. Why repeating 
the word place twice. So the mystical interpretation is that first we should establish God in heaven, which is Ainai, heavenly king. And only then we can place here a king on earth. So the repetition of the word place is, is, is a duality. So why, what is the meaning of this duality? That the kingdom of, of earth, the kingdom of God on earth must be totally and completely permitted by the heavenly kingdom. So the ultimate and messianic king of kings will be the one that will reveal this heavenly dimension of earth. So the divine heavenly kingdom will be one with the earthly kingdom, so to bring enlightenment to the entire world. The Messiah will be the king that will bring a new set of guidelines by which humanity will enter a new stage of existence. And he will utilize every aspect of earthly existence, including uh, politics, economy, uh, warfare as well, because that will be the only way to rectify every aspect of mankind's life and to elevate. Remember the word elevate, elevate that we were using when we were talking about Adam being given the commandment of conquer the earth and conquer the earth means elevate, conquer that hidden light which is present in every aspect of human life but that needs to be liberated. So we see here that if we do not understand this fundamental biblical concept, we cannot grasp to the maximum the depth of the mission of his imperial majesty and why did he had to do all the things that he has done during his life. If we fail, to accept and penetrate this concept of kingship and the tremendous power that carries with it, we, we, we then, then the kingship of his imperial majesty and our faith has very little relevance as we do not penetrate why the Messiah had to come not as a deity but as a human-like king. So, before the coming of Messiah, there were many, many prophecies, yeah? And the reason why we can identify this messianic king is because we have hundreds of years, I should say thousands of years of prophecies, right? So, let's look at a few of them, which will be relevant for I and I. According to prophecies, before the coming of Messiah, there had to be a new world order, a new world order. In other words, things were no longer the same as before. So there was supposed to be a tremendous, a universal uh, change of what was the life on earth before Messiah and what would become after Messiah. This is a period of transition that occurs so that Messiah can come and show the world a new way of living, a new way of existing by which mankind could ensure, ensure uh, not only its safety on earth but also its it's, 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 it's happiness and well-being. So first thing is a new world order. And obviously, I mean, everybody that knows history can relate to that when reading uh, about his imperial majesty, when he was born and what was the context that witnessed the birth of his imperial majesty. In a few words, a world in transition no longer um, a, 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 a world of the past, but a world on the edge of future, present going towards a future. Nothing, nothing would have stayed the same. 
let's continue. Uh, the first sign of the coming of Messiah is the lack of leadership around the world. The world will not be accustomed to obey and there will be shortage of true leaders. This is another important factor that we read in the prophecies. It does not mean that there were no leaders physically speaking. Of course, there were leaders, but they were like puppets. It was hard to look around and to see genuine leaders, true leaders that you could put your faith in. So this is another sign that um, announced the coming of Messiah. The second sign is nations would be at animosity. Yeah, so there will be a diffuse conflict amongst nation and people. The distress and the dislike amongst nation would be impossible to identify from where it started. That's an, another sign, important sign. It's like, it's like you see that things are not going well around you. You see that it's complete chaos, but it's like you cannot trace from where it started. So that was the atmosphere that was prophesied to be the atmosphere that Messiah will find on his return on earth. Total state of conflict and chaos. Another sign is the complete loss of authority. People forgot how to obey, not only to whom to obey, but also how to obey. So people was unruly. Everybody was doing was, was, was doing what they want. Everybody was doing on an international level, was, do, was doing what they want. They were breaking laws, they were breaking trades, agreements, you know, it doesn't matter. I do what I want. So this is what the prophecy, prophecies say will be the world that Messiah will find. Yeah. So how will we realize that he is the Messiah? First sign is people will genuinely obey him. There will be something strange, so supernatural with Messiah. The people will be inclined in a genuine way, in a natural way to obey him because he will inspire that trust. He will inspire that feeling that he knows exactly what is right to do. So this is the kingship of the Messiah and the effect that will have on the people in a world of chaos, right? The role of the Messiah is to uh, reestablish the house of David and not to do any miracles. That is also very important. Yeah. So according to tradition, Messiah in his return will not perform any miracles. Yeah. In fact, in fact, there will be also people demanding for miracles, but there will there will not be any open air miracles. No miracles under the eyes of the world. We're not saying that there will not be any other miracles or any private miracles. And I mean, we know that the life of His Imperial Majesty is also filled with supernatural events but what we're saying here is that messiah will not show his kingship through miracles but throughout the world miracles will be like being a magician i come here there is something bad i fix it with a miracle poof everything is fine right now no messiah will have to bring the world to a level of enlightenment through his own hard work. Messiah will be the most hard working man on earth. And uh, it's very fascinating and curious that uh, ancient uh, prophecies, they go down in details to such an extent that they say that the King Messiah will sleep very little and will devote the most of his time during his day to work and to um, teaching the people. Because another role of Messiah, another job, we should say not a role, but another job of Messiah 
alongside being the king is to be a teacher. What shall Messiah teach? Messiah shall teach how to live in a new humanity, how to live in a new world, how basically to become member of a new race. Messiah is expected to change human behavior. People will learn to live together. And of course, we recall the prophecy, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The role of Messiah is uh, to let everybody see that his kingdom is not his, but of the Father. So Messiah is the one that knows best that his kingdom is of the Father, and the Father reigns through him forever. So one very interesting thing is that in Kabbalah, kingdom, kingdom is called the mirror, yeah, Malkut. In Hebrew, kingdom, the, the, the level, the stage, the dimension of kingdom is called a mirror, is compared to a mirror. Why? Because every soul looks in the mirror and sees herself. So what does this have to do with Messiah? Messiah will be the mirror in which everyone will look into and will see the best version of their self. So if I am a man in doubt, if I am a bad man, I will look into Messiah and automatically I will see what I could become, who I could become. I will see the best version of myself. So the king is the mirror in which humanity will look into and see the best of its own destiny. In other words, humanity will see the best option that mankind has looking at the king. And of course, I mean, there is no, there is no reason for me to point out that the king has been the vessel of freedom on planet Earth when the dark coat of Nazi fascism was uh, imposing its demonical regime all over the world. And the nations, they were, they were eaten off, they were ruined, they were worked by this rust, which was the Nazi fascist regime and, 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 and ideology. So His Majesty was that mirror in which people were looking and saying, hey, if we come out of this, we can become like he is. So his radiancy was naturally, magnetically attracting people to follow him. That's why, that's why, that's why it is said in the prophecy that at the end of time, the fullness of time, when Messiah will have to fight against the anti-Messiah, he will fight by the breath of his lips. And we see this in, in, in Isaiah. I should be more precise. Isaiah said that he will defy the enemy by the breath of his lips. That means through words, utterances, speech, and prayers. What does come out of the mouth, what does come out from the lips of the King of Kings? Speech, utterances, and prayers. So that is exactly what we see in the 30s happening on planet Earth. So, one of the final questions that is left to answer tonight, and then I will, you know, leave it to Brother Nati, is why his imperial majesty came at a time? I mean, let's just be honest. Why did we have to wait 2,000 years for Christ to return? I mean, he could, he could have come back much earlier. He could have come back just a few years after his first appearance here on planet Earth. No, we had to wait 2,000 years. And so somebody could say, oh, because, you know, there was a lack of 
religious people, pious people. Well, that's not true. You know, maybe there were more pious people back then than in the time in which His Imperial Majesty was born and ruled over Earth. So somebody could say, oh, well, you know, there was more godliness back then. Well, yes, exactly. And so why didn't Messiah arrive, returned, when there was more godliness, when people was living a more simple life, when people was more devoted to those principles and to, you know, to those values which make uh, human life dignified? Why? Because he arrived in the time in which there was more the need of a righteous leader. In Hebrew, leader means speakers. So when we say the word leader, we also mean the word speaker. They have the same word, two concepts with the same word. So Messiah will speak non-political and he will be non-politically non correct. He will speak the truth and he will swim against the current. He will think out of the box. That is another characteristic of Messiah that we learn from tradition and from the prophecies. So why does his imperial majesty arrive when he arrives? Why not before? Because only in those years he could have implement his full mission to the maximum. Because in those years, there was really the need, not of a Messiah up in the sky, but of a true, concrete, solid, tangible figure, which would be the leader for mankind. Because mankind was in complete chaos. So everybody that come with something reasonable, they would follow him. But, but they would not uh, they would they would not be content only with a religious figure in other words in those days in those in that time a god coming down from sky would not be making any difference the religious values the spiritual values they were in crisis the same way that is when his imperial majesty could have act in the best manner. And that is when his work could have shown the best of the results. To explain it in another way, maybe in a simpler way. The way to relate to the King Messiah in his ultimate coming is... is to take away all the, all, the, all the religious and the heavenly aspect of it. The Messiah in his final advent is not a heavenly figure. He must be a terrestrial figure. So only when Messiah can be considered in that way, then he will make his appearance on earth. But if people was waiting for another Jesus or another Jesus like Messiah, then it would not have worked. The only way to elevate the earth and to fulfill the commandment given to Adam to perfect earth and to conquer it he was to come in the mundane world to bring the heavenly dimension and the, 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 the terrestrial dimension together in a perfect oneness. And that is why we can now talk 
about the King Messiah. But if we do not understand all those aspects that we have been reasoning so far, then we tend to look at his imperial majesty just like a new Jesus, which he is not. Yes, of course, he is Christ in his kingly character. Yes, of course, we hail Jesus Christus. Yes, of course, we believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, of course, we are also Christian. Yes, of course, we are also Orthodox. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing that the best to speak about the Orthodox faith and the Orthodox tradition. My two daughters are both baptized in the Tawaedo Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but I and I is Rastafari. We are a different breed. And until we keep looking at his imperial majesty, in the same way we look at Jesus, but just with a new name and a different name, we not get into the fullness of it. We not get into that fullness that I and I ancients brought to us and handled to us as a corpus, as a tradition. And maybe they did not even study all these sources that, to which we have access nowadays. But they saw it, they cite all of that in a vision, in a spiritual inspiration. So now we have the power to combine the things, the ancient culture, the ancient knowledge, and the figure of his imperial majesty. So Aina is the generation that is bringing the things together, is bridging these two sides of the story. And we are seeing the fullness in the work, in the person, in the utterances, but above everything else, in the kingship of his imperial majesty. So it's almost one hour I'm talking. I'm just going to take a couple of more minutes. So how is this relevant to INI? In INI Rastafari Liberty. Well, it turns out that there is, there are sparks of kingship in everything we experience on earth, everywhere we go, everything we do, every people we meet, every action we take on ourselves, every thought, every feeling, everything contains this inner light of kingship. So, what do we do? Just like Adam was given the commandment of conquering the earth, we have to do the same. So conquering the earth means that we are just like Adam. That is why Adam was created by himself. Because each one of us has the same power and duty to perform this mission on earth and to elevate kingship in everything we see. And that is more or less what Rastafari say when, when we say, we run things and things now run we. So this is this concept explained in a more biblical uh, fashion, we could say. But there are sparks of kingship in everything we do. And what are we called to do? We are called to collaborate and to be partners with the Almighty in this divine mission. And that is why, once again, his imperial majesty that does not arrive as a preacher, as a teacher, as a meditation master, but he arrives as a person that had to face every possible circumstance of life. Either bad and good, happy and not happy, easier and difficult. That is to show that darkness is there to be transformed. And in fact, darkness, it can be the greatest ally for light if we know how to take it. And that is why His Imperial Majesty also went to meet and encounter people and head of state that we could be really skeptical about. I mean, so many times people say, oh, but why, does why did his imperial majesty went to meet with this and that? And I mean, we know he was a criminal. We know that because just like the bad kings 
of the Old Testament, we have the bad kings in the modern time. His imperial majesty had to deal with them individually because his imperial majesty is that force, is that messianic force, which is able to activate the messianic force in each one of us, including the wicked rulers of the earth. And uh, I mean, we could look at the things saying, try to imagine if his imperial majesty did not go and talk to this ruler or to that ruler, what could have happened? We might not know. But we do know that this imperial majesty went and speak to them. So clearly there was something to redeem right there. So coming to a conclusion, and I do give thanks for the attention and for the, 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 the energy, coming to a conclusion, when it comes to kingship, it is not a coincidence that Rastafari address his fellow brother as king and his fellow sister as empress. This is not just good manners, good education, royalty, royalness. There is something more and it is something much more profound that we might think. We have to conduct our lives according to this highest principle of kingship, which does not mean, you know, to get our heads big, but means really to honor the reason why we depend on earth, really to fulfill the mission that was given to I and I uh, forefather. And through the example of his imperial majesty, now we can even easier, is e more easily apply it to this generation and to the, the, to the generation to come. So everything is explained there, is 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 up to I and I to find a way to read it, to penetrate it, and then, even more important, to put it in practice. So it turns out that Rastafari liberty is the ultimate way of kingship on earth. When you don't have to be the king with the crown, with the kingdom, in order to fulfill this job. But each one of I and I, and in fact, I should say, each human being left aside background, religion, race, or creed, each human being, even non Rastafari, are kings and queens of this creation. They have this innate mission of kingship in themselves. And that is why, to answer the final question, how do we look at the non Rastafari nation when it comes to kingship? Was his imperial majesty only king of the Ethiopians? No. It started from Ethiopia. The whole thing started from Ethiopia, but the objective was the entire world. Just as we know that Aina is the light unto the nations, what does that mean? That we have to work with the nations of the world. And the nations of the world have to work with Aina. So we are in the same boat. That is why we should come out of this we and them mentality. Why? Because the kingship of his imperial majesty and what we have been saying so far in the Bible concerning the negative kings and the spark of goodness that was in there to be, re to be released, then that should make I and I meditate upon the fact that every person that we meet on the street non-Rasta, that apparently look even non-moral to us. To some extent, we could also call them the wicked ones. They do have also a spark of messianic force in there, waiting to be released. So that is now left in us, leaving us with a strong meditation concerning Babylon as well. So why is there Babylon? What should we do with Babylon? Should we, should we be just condemning and leave it there? Or should we maybe look at the example of Daniel and what he managed to do with Nabucodonosor? So these are all things I and I, Rastafari people and the world at large should consider in order to fulfill 
the ultimate mission that I and I, Father, God and King, and pray, Elias Slas the first, show through the, his powers, through his mercy, and through his tremendous light in order for I and I to follow and fulfill. So I give thanks to the powers of his imperial majesty and pray the eye, Celestia, majesty. Yeah. Yeah.